Oh, you stay there all the time? No, no, I will take a few minutes to introduce you. Yeah, you can sit there. You will make an introduction. Yeah, you can. I think it's bad for you to sit together. Sorry, you? Yeah, yeah. No one can see it if he is sitting on the stage. Yeah, but just. Добрий вечір, шановні колеги, друзі та гості. Ми раді вас вітати на останньому тижні Київський бійнал 2017 в Київському інтернаціоналі. Just immediately switching into English, it's my really pleasure to introduce to you our today's guests. Uh, I will just shortly uh, say from the very beginning that uh, today's debate called the New Internationale Above and Below the Nation is a continuation of the event that took place uh, basically one month ago within the Trans-Europe Festival 2017 in Madrid, Spain at the end of October and uh, our Visual Culture Research Center was also participating within this uh, festival which was organized by the organization European Alternatives and we uh, also conducted the debate there together with, it was accompanied by an um, exhibition curated by Oksana Prykhovetska called Feminist Texts uh, in, in one of the locations of this festival and it's not the first time that we are collaborating with the Trans Europa Festival and with the European organization Alternatives organization because uh, two years ago we also had uh, a cross sort of biennial festival collaboration uh, in Belgrade where there was a Trans Europa festival conducted there and they also had uh, their event in, in, within the biennial in Kyiv. And today um, we have three guests um, and I will probably start with the moderator who is uh, Lorenzo Marsilli. He is a political activist, a co-founder of the European Alternatives Organization and also an activist from the DM25 movement. He will moderate the debate and it's also my pleasure to present to you Oliver Ressler, an Austrian Vienna-based artist whose exhibition together with Marina Labrushkina's one uh, called Dead Souls you can still see till the end of this week at our premises on Wojcicka Street and also you, me, an artist and a, a teacher, a curator who is working at the, in Cologne at the um, Art uh, Academy and they will present their project there. So it's my pleasure to welcome you in Kyiv and I will just immediately pass the microphone to Lorenzo. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, Vasil, and thank you to the team of the Kiev Vienna. It's an absolutely fantastic initiative that, that you're doing here. And uh, as you were mentioning, it's now a few years that we're collaborating, and uh, we certainly should collaborate uh, going forward. It's particularly interesting to be in this beautiful space and speaking about uh, the new international. If ever, as uh, you were hinting before, this space has to be. Uh, taken over by property developers, uh, perhaps to enlarge the kind of uh, shopping mall experience that you have nearby, then we should organize international cultural brigades to come and occupy the space and uh, transform it into a self-managed cultural center. Uh, so keep us also updated with what happens to this very important um, piece, of, piece of historical architecture. Um, it's interesting that uh, the theme of the Biennale is the New International. We were discussing this earlier on with Basil, uh, because as you know, this is a moment when, on the contrary, nationalism is making uh, a comeback. Uh, not only here, not only in Russia, also in Western Europe. There is a trend towards renationalization, a trend towards xenophobia, a trend towards walling oneself in behind smaller and smaller communities or making our national communities more and more exclusionary. Uh, exclusionary towards, uh, in the case of Western Europe, often the migrants, in the case of uh, some Central and Eastern European countries, uh, women. Uh, I was in Poland just a couple of days ago and uh, you, you will know that over the last month there have been extraordinary protest movements of uh, Polish women against the criminalization of abortion. Um, and um, 
this trend of uh, national retrenchment on the one hand and retrenchment onto a narrowly defined natural people, original people, who is actually a citizen of the country, <coughs> normally it tends to be heterosexual white men primarily, uh, is, uh, is a very worrying one. Uh, what is instead very hopeful is that there is equally uh, the demand for uh, the opposite, uh, a certain openness, a certain transnational collaboration, uh, that uh, this year also becomes the theme of this, uh, of this biennial. I must say that particularly when I go to Eastern Europe, I find this, um, this demand, which is um, understandable on, on the one hand, but also very inspiring, because it seems to me that uh, uh, more traditionally European countries of the West have, uh, to some extent, um, given for granted for very long the privilege and stability and democracy they had acquired, and are now in a situation of uh, disorientation when they find um, these democracies actually being challenged from within, even in countries of Western Europe. Oliver comes from Austria, and as we know, uh, there is a, a far-right party that uh, is in coalition talks to end up in the government, right, at the moment. Uh, something else that I think is important about um, Eastern Europe is that actually the idea of Europe seems to be much more alive here than it is uh, in uh, traditional countries of the West. Uh, this was the case in Poland a couple of days ago. We were at uh, a forum that once again was calling for an international solidarity with uh, cultural workers of Poland against the repression of the uh, far-right government, against uh, artists that are doing controversial artworks that are closed by the government or that see neo-fascist protests in front of their, of their theatres. And the idea of what uh, Europe should signify, what Europe should be the name of, actually finds uh, a much more elaborate, emotional, passionate answer um, here in Ukraine, in countries such as Poland, than it does at the moment uh, in, um, in countries of Western Europe. This is worrying on the one hand, but it's also very encouraging. So we really need to break down this idea of core and periphery, because the periphery of Europe, uh, which includes Ukraine as much as it includes Italy now, is actually much more at the core of a certain discourse on what Europe should be the name of, uh, what type of internationalism can be the alternative to the nationalist backlash that we, that we experience. Um, we're going to leave the stage now in a minute and leave you just with Oliver, so I just want to tell you a couple of words of what's going to happen this evening. Um, as Basil was saying, we continue a uh, discussion that uh, we organized in Madrid in a day-long forum um, on the 28th of October, just, uh, just a month ago, uh, looking at um, uh, the crisis of the nation-state, of the national forum, from uh, both below and above. Uh, the, the full day of discussions in Madrid was really focused on looking at what is moving at a level that is smaller than the nation state. So the experience of uh, municipalism, of new uh, citizens platform that take over uh, municipal politics in, in cities, notably in Spain, everybody will know Ada Colau from Barcelona, but uh, also beyond, in Belgrade for instance, there is a citizen movement of activists that are now going to be running for elections in spring for the city hall of uh, Belgrade in Serbia, and it goes way beyond that as well. So what moves at a level beyond the nation, below the nation state, and then obviously what is happening above the nation state. So the crisis of globalization, questions of international solidarity, uh, the question of the European Union as a, a post-national political model that is clearly in a very uh, deep existential crisis today. Uh, I don't want to, to force the same dichotomy or the same um, uh, scheme, framework, too much onto, onto today's discussion, but I think you will see, at least in some of the work that Oliver will show you, that uh, there is an emphasis on small communities, for instance in the, the ZAD uh, video from, uh, from France, uh, experiences of, of locality, of localism, um, and when Mr. Yumi will uh, Tell us a little bit more about uh, the situation of the Silk Road, of China, China's view of globalization. We'll have instead a, a very uh, above the nation or beyond the nation um, view of the, on, 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 this, on this conversation. So the idea is that uh, Oliver is going to run us through uh, a bit of his work. He's going to show some videos um, that, that he's worked on recently and less recently. 
uh, uh, and then we'll swap over to, to Yumi, uh, who will also give a presentation, uh, showing some, some photography and some maps. And uh, we'll then try to open it up to ask both Oliver and Yumi some questions and maybe have a conversation uh, since the very beginning, since the very start, to open it up to a, to a debate with everybody who is here. It's, I think, particularly interesting to have this exchange. I mean, you know, we have an Italian, an Austrian, a Chinese. It's the beginning of a joke. Uh, all of them are in Ukraine in a festival or in a dining on the international. I think it's good if we make this uh, a dynamic exchange between all of us in, in the room rather than just a Q&A with Oliver and, uh, and Yubi. Okay, with that, I leave the floor to Oliver. Uh, you will have seen Oliver Lesley is, is an Austrian artist. He's been uh, working uh, for many years now in quite close uh, contact also with social experiences, political experiences, movements. Um, and in a certain sense, I mean, you will tell me later if political art or political artist is a, is a term that you like or not, but certainly your work, Oliver's work, is, is a reference point also in people who are doing political activism on the ground and find that the work that, that, uh, that Oliver does not only a narration of their own struggles, but an inspiration uh, on, uh, on how to take those, those struggles forward. So, I leave it to you, Oliver, and uh, yeah, we'll come back when you're done. Yeah, thanks Lorenzo for the introduction. Thanks Vasil for the invitation. Um, there are a couple of my works in the uh, biennial that have already a quite close relationship to a discussion uh, of, of the nation, I think. And I thought I will not talk about these projects here in this presentation. Uh, today, but use this more as a chance to give kind of, of an extension of my artistic practice and to show uh, a couple of other works uh, that I think might make sense to show and discuss uh, and see uh, uh, within this uh, notion. And uh, so uh, I'm an artist and filmmaker, and yeah, there are actually quite a lot of works uh, that are, I think, of, important, uh, of importance for this uh, discussion within my body of work. And one I would like to choose uh, because uh, it really also gives kind of a definition of the nation, uh, what I would consider an important uh, way of how to approach the term, and I thought it might make sense to put this at the very beginning of, of a presentation. So this is part of a project called um, Emergency Turned Upside Down, which is a 16 minute long film that I produced in 2016. It's an animation uh, with text and it was done on in relation to the so-called summer of migration of 2015, when a couple of hundred thousand refugees, asylum seekers, entered the Schengen zone, entered the European Union uh, in an attempt uh, to apply for asylum there. And uh, this uh, yeah, is, was, I think, a very important uh, step of self empowerment for those people who made this uh, step uh, and uh, having worked on borders, migration, uh, institutional racism and things like that for quite a bit I was of course very interested in it and tried to uh, make some arguments I felt that were somehow missing in, in, in a larger uh, discourse. So I, I will just start uh, with with this, and it's like a six minute excerpt. Um, can we turn off the lights? Some people dream that nations are natural, but the dream is a waste product of nation states. The nation is artificial nature. The state came first and imagined a community to fit. 
The dream of nations as nature is raised to nation, even when all national culture. Managers of poverty are pleased to leave the poor, gnawing on chunks of national identity. Soon, they will gnaw on each other. Homelands are spiritual homeless shelters, supervised punch-ups permitted for the physically foreclosed. Under new normal capitalist realism, the market is another sort of artificial nature. National administration loses some autonomy in an EU-style supranational body. But the EU never sought to overthrow the nation-state. Rather, the point was to change it. Single EU states are sent out in perpetual competition, each against the other, national gladiators in a regulated arena. Competitive devaluation of social, fiscal, labor law, compulsory self-harm for Europeans. So beneficially, in the famous race to the bottom, capital is a surefire way. The magic of competitiveness, magicians say, is that it works on every level. What's good for national gladiators goes for populations too. Workers in one state must fight those in the next, while also fighting each other. Economic transport in one country make it competitive against national rivals, and so on, up to EU versus US and assorted for economies. Nationalism is one reaction among many to the economic strangling of the former first world working class. Of all those possible reactions, the strangling class likes this one best. Borders, national, supranational borders. What are these borders without which the people smuggling business model the hyper-exploitation supply chain would die. Fictive borders, no less real for that reason. Borders restrict more than free movement. They delete rights retroactively. They escape clause in the rights of man and the citizen. Non-citizens need not apply. Nazi law stripped its victims of nationality before they could be killed. The killers might otherwise have breached the rights of the citizen. Borders, by definition, discriminate which in this case is to say they kill. Discriminating first between capital, which crosses freely, and human bodies, labor in the treaties, to be detained, deported, drowned, enslaved, at God God's discretion. Free 
voting capital against the vote of public trust. Communities enclosed by modern borders are retroactively called natural. Borders, built into capital, set wages, withhold welfare, hand down life sentences of survival or less. Um, yeah, maybe it says a lot about uh, also the situation in which we are, that we are here in a, a quite cold space without uh, any heating while you get, uh, talking about uh, and presenting works about uh, the beyond and the below of the nations, while next to us there's this huge shopping mall uh, which is uh, very well heated or so and uh, it's probably also in terms of architecture. Um, more representative of the uh, current hegemonic uh, uh, system. Um, a situation where uh, there was a more friendly environment for all kinds of progressive uh, forms of discussion uh, and uh, topics uh, was uh, during the so-called Bolivarian process in uh, Venezuela which was the strongest when Hugo Chavez was still uh, alive. And, um, uh, yeah, as Lorenzo already uh, mentioned, uh, I will uh, now show more or less three different examples which show different forms of self-organizing uh, that, of course, can in a way also be seen uh, yeah, as um, as a below the nation, uh, but maybe also, especially this example has also really um, an importance of thinking beyond the nation, and I will explain later on why. Um, in Venezuela, I'm not sure. In as far as uh, I have to uh, also a um, uh, historical introduction, but. Uh, to do it very quickly in 1998, uh, Hugo Chavez, after a long process, won the election there, and then what happened was a year-long process of transformation uh, that uh, involved that the uh, basic needs of the people were covered, which was not the case in the, in the previous uh, 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 years and um, also a, long, a long process of education started so there was a quite high level of illiteracy among people there uh, and uh, so they started to yeah, learn people to read and to write and uh, uh, made uh, the university system for free for everyone and provided people with a stipendium and also very soon already existing structures of self-organization and of self-management, uh, smaller uh, assemblies were uh, um, yeah, extended and uh, supplied with funds. And uh, so in collaboration with Dario and Celini, I worked on a cycle of three films. And, uh, the Comuna under construction, as the English title of this film is, was actually the third one. Uh, we did, and this focuses on the so-called Consejos Comunales, which are communal councils, which are kind of community meetings where people decide on local um, things. They, they can decide on whatever they think what is important for them. Uh, and the interesting, interesting thing is that uh, in, in relation to, to Argentina, for example, where such uh, networks also existed and uh, still exist to some extent, was that uh, these uh, uh, consejos comunales were supplied with, with a budget. So when they decided, the community decided, the neighborhood decided, we'll need a new street, or we need a bus, a public transport, or we need a new water system, or whatever, or a kindergarten, or whatever, uh, then they could uh, apply for a grant, and then they would get this money, probably, uh, from the government. And there was a very good chance to get it. So almost 50% of all proposals that were uh, submitted, they got their grant. 
So the state in Venezuela uh, put really billions of euros um, every year, every year into these uh, consensus communales. So it's, which is a very different idea than, let's say, in relation to a social state where the state just supplies certain things. Venezuela also did this like that to a certain extent, but uh, it, it's more, it, it awaits for the initiative of the people and they should see and decide what is important for a society, a small group of people, a neighborhood, that they really fight for and, uh, and, and formulate a proposal. And if this is something where the government thinks that makes sense, which in the case of the kindergarten or a new suite will uh, quite sure be the case, uh, then they supply the money for it and leave it to the community to set up the structure. So they give the, the money directly to the community and there were numerous cases, for example, when, well, they got a fund for a kindergarten, but then when they had the money, then they said, well, we won't ask a construction firm, but we will build it on ourselves uh, on ourselves uh, during the weekends and then there will still be some money left and we can do another institution like an um, extension for a school or whatever or a new heating or, or air condition or whatever. So, um, and there is, so the Consecus Commonaris is more or less this uh, structure on the um, directly in the, in the community and there are also structures um, <clears throat> that were in construction, uh, and this is also what the title refers to, uh, that went beyond this local organizing. <clears throat> and uh, so there was the common city uh, as one above. And I would like to show an excerpt, uh, uh, I think seven or eight minutes, of one of these meetings where actually uh, delegates from Consejos Coronares uh, met um, in Barinas, which is uh, a district in the countryside, uh, and, and discussed just about the meaning and the function of this. Tengamos a la disposición. 
Y se requiere que nosotros comencemos a reflexionar a fondo, y lo dice el presidente Chávez, en qué y cómo invertimos nuestro tiempo. Nuestro tiempo. A veces, muy poco, podemos percibir de que, de que es importante ir a una asamblea del Consejo Comunal, porque a lo mejor es más importante quedarme en la casa trabajando, labrando la tierra. Pero al fin de cuentas ustedes tienen 10 años, 20 años en, en esta zona trabajando la tierra y siguen siendo compañeros campesinos que apenas se alcanzan con el queso cuando se llevan al centro de acopio a comprar la merca, ¿verdad? Porque eso qué quiere decir, no necesariamente porque le invitamos todos los días a la finca, vamos a resolver el problema de buen estado de vida de nuestra comunidad y nuestra familia. O si el año trae 365 días, ¿cuántos días hay del año yo lo voy a invertir a la lucha social? Es decir, ¿cuántas veces yo voy a estar dispuesto a salir a encontrarme y a exigirle al alcalde o a encontrarme y a exigirle al gobernador o a encontrarme y a exigirle al ministro o a encontrarme y a exigirle a los diferentes instituciones que representan el Estado que son parte del Estado para que le dé solución a mis problemas si solución que no voy a poder resolver yo por mi propia iniciativa nosotros le decíamos y hacíamos un, una reflexión en la ciudad comunal socialista campesina Simón Bolívar y le decíamos a la comunidad que nos van a recibir el próximo miércoles van a recibir 33 mil millones de bolívares de financiamiento y eso es producto de la lucha nosotros le decíamos, bueno, ¿cuánto, va a, cu ¿cuánto vamos a ganar más? Si trabajando en el fondo todos los días o invirtiendo en una cantidad de días a la lucha. E hicimos la reflexión y la gente, bueno, ¿qué queremos nosotros más? ¿A nuestra parcela individual, a nuestra parcela o a la cartera? La gente decía que queremos las dos cosas igual. Necesitamos tanto la vialidad como la parcela. Entonces decíamos, ¿cuántos días le invertimos a la parcela y cuántos días le invertimos a la vialidad? A la parcela le invertimos todo el año y a la vialidad no le invertimos ni un día para ir a la lucha para ir a, a exigirle al, al alcalde, para ir a exigirle al gobernador o para reunirnos, para ir a exigirle al ministro o a la institución. Le invertimos muy poco. Decimos que la necesitamos, pero no le invertimos tiempo. Es necesario que nosotros, compañeros, estemos conscientes de que si nosotros queremos a la cartera, si nosotros queremos a la escuela, si nosotros queremos, tanto como a nuestra casa, porque ellos estudian los niños, tenemos que invertir el tiempo. En la Simón Bolívar llegamos a la, a la Y he soñado y 
o un I always found it so uh, amazing to, uh, that people, in this case, probably one or two hundred people, uh, can find a consensus uh, that eighty percent of them agree that uh, twenty years, uh, twenty days per year, are being committed to social struggle outside of the region where they live. So this is. Uh, that, that always reminds me that how far we also have to go with our struggles in, in our countries. Um, another project I would like to talk about uh, is probably something which is the most well-known. So in 2011, uh, this uh, Occupy movement uh, emerged in the U.S. as the most visible sign, but the square movements in different other cities uh, uh, have already existed uh, before. And I decided to produce a work titled Take the Square, which focuses on three of these uh, squares I considered uh, as important. Uh, New York, Madrid, and Athens, and created kind of a situation where I invited five to six people who actively participated in these square movements uh, to sit on, on the square and to discuss primarily themes of organizing. So um, my main questions and the questions were the same for all these uh, three cities. Uh, were, uh, so how uh, does the assembly look like? Uh, how does this format of the working sessions look like? How do assemblies and uh, different, different councils communicate uh, with, with each other on the national or on the international uh, level, what kind of exchange is there? When I produced the film, um, all of the occupations were already evicted, so uh, the central question was also what's the meaning and the function of an occupation when it's already over and uh, what can be, what can happen afterwards. Uh, and I tried out different things like um, bring together already existing groups and make them discussing these issues or also uh, compiling or inviting people of, with maybe different backgrounds uh, together um, to talk about these questions in front of the, of the camera. And um, I will choose now one uh, excerpt from New York, uh, which was recorded in Central Park. Um, for the film it was also important that uh, not to work with any permissions, because if you work on or on occupation, I mean you cannot do a film where you first ask for a permission. So when we started to record on security park, then uh, this was the negative side uh, of this, then uh, security uh, guides and le le later on the police uh, kicked, us out, kicked us out of the space. So the main part uh, on Occupy takes place now at Central Park, where at that time where I was there with my film team, there was just a larger uh, spring event for Occupy occur by Wall Street in, in Central Park. Talk about issues 
that affect like the larger geographical region. Um, and everyone here is a stakeholder in, from their community in, in this larger conversation. Uh, so yeah, I have a lot of hope for direct democracy um, as a tool to reorganize society. The world needs to be organized by direct democracy. That's the only way. If the goal is to end oppression, which is my goal, and I wouldn't go ahead and say that that's the goal of the Occupy movement, but, you know, if the goal is to end oppression, then you can never do that if you're empowering other people to represent you. And um, even worse, if other people are empowering people to represent you. <laughs> you know, and so I just think that the only way that people can make their own decisions about their own lives which is one of the things that's necessary to not be oppressed. <laughs> um, the only way you can do that is if you actually have the power in your society and in your world to do that. You can make more people believe that direct democracy might work by modeling it, right? Like, and there's a lot of pressure because then people all, could also see all the things about it that didn't work. You were on this big public stage, and that's true, that's legit. It does, it doesn't work. But like just like any dual power thing, like I, I, I think like as this goes forward to constantly be trying to build that up and model it is one of the crucial ways to take down the nation state, is to demonstrate to people there is this viable alternative and it's learning and it's growing and it needs you. The nation state actually doesn't need you. It doesn't require any of your input. And only like 40% of you pretend like you care about it anyways every four years. <laughs> so like, you know, this needs you. Uh, yeah. Or it invites you. Right, right. Yeah. 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 To be honest, that doesn't invite you, but. I, I also think it's important to note how difficult that is in a society where like, we centralize everything. So the concept of like, actually on my block, in my community, that's where like, it matters the most for me to be. I feel like even Occupy is kind of a nod to the installation is centralized because everyone's like, oh, well, like this is the thing. Here it is. This is where it's at. But it's like, actually, no, you can occupy anywhere you are and like make this model work for you in your own environment. And that's where it's the most powerful. So, and the last project I would like to present uh, is actually the third part of an ongoing cycle dealing with the resistance to global warming. Uh, the project is titled Everything's Coming Together When Everything's Falling Apart. Um, and so it's following a couple of different uh, activities, uh, mass civil disobedience uh, actions. Uh, and the one I would like to present here, and which might be of interest for our discussion nowadays, uh, is about the Tzad. The uh, Tzad uh, emerged uh, of a struggle against an airport uh, construction uh, close to Nantes uh, in France. And it has already a longer history, so this airport was planned to be built already a couple of decades ago, but uh, um, like seven or eight years ago, a uh, large part of this area was um, occupied by squatters as a result uh, or as an effect uh, of a climate camp that took place there. And um, finally, the state wanted to evict these uh, occupations uh, in 2012. And, uh, that faced a massive resistance from the local popul um, population. Uh, Three, uh, 30,000 people actively participated in the resistance uh, against uh, this uh, airport construction, which is, I think, really a lot, especially for the countryside. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, so the, the the police tried to evict this, and this lasted longer than a month in the winter, but it was also very cold. Uh, but the, the, the people resisted, and finally the, the state gave up, more or less, and they described this area, which is as large as a huge airport, so it's sort of like 
12 kilometers long and two or three kilometers wide, so it's quite a, a, a huge uh, area. They regard this, the, the state regards this as an abandoned area. And afterwards, uh, so the past five years, um, yeah, lots of collectives, lots of uh, individuals moved there and tried to set up their own thing. So there's no police, there's no money there now, there's uh, officially not even electricity, but there is electricity. Uh, and yeah, I will just show an uh, uh, excerpt about a discussion with participants uh, of the Tsar who all live uh, there. Even if the project is uh, stopped, then for us there's a new struggle to come, uh, which means defending what we have built here together with not just the people living here, but also all the other people coming in support uh, through all these years and uh, continue, uh, yeah, try to continue living here together as we, as we, uh, yeah, as we try to already and uh, also continue our projects and keep this zone free from the government and free from police and free from prison.
probably most of them make me want to scream. Um, but I think that there is something that is really beautiful. So you don't impose the model. You don't have that thing about from now on, this is how we're going to make decisions because that doesn't work. We can say that over the large majority of situations, we don't vote. And that there is there is a, a very very strong. Um, Resistance and like awareness that basically voting is just it's applying quantitative um, techniques to what is eminently qualitative uh, situation. So it's stupid and it basically means that the minority doesn't count and then, you know it's okay to crush it because you know you got forty nine percent. There is a, an attempt therefore to try to make decisions in many different variations of consensus. So, um, as a last image, I just thought it's maybe nice to show this work, which uh, was kind of inspired. It's, it's already more than ten years ago that I did it. Uh, it was inspired by, I think, a quote of the subcommandant Marcos of the Zapatistas, um, and I, I thought it's so so rich, also in terms of language. That it's maybe nice. Image. Thank you very much, Oliver, for the wonderful examples. And I have the um, quite difficult task of, of, of changing the level of discussion from the very situated, fairly recent examples that everybody can relate to, to a level that is the, above the state, as Lorenzo um, kind of commissioned me to do. Um, which uh, also means that we'll be dealing with uh, topics of nationalism, of the form of the nation state, of capitalism, of what the power of the state can have, and um, and um, yes, yeah, so I'll go a little bit back uh, into a slightly deeper past in the hope of also um, clarifying certain things for the future. Uh, maybe a little bit more of a personal uh, biologic, uh, biographical note to myself. I work a lot with um, the, the vast area between East Asia and Europe, uh, known as Central Asia or Eurasia, or uh, uh, covering the, 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 the ancient uh, trade routes of the Silk Road. But um, I look at the sort of um, political history of it, looking at also archaeological evidences of it, in trying to understand actually um, the Silk Road as a decentralized network back in the days, and using that as a metaphor of uh, the um, unhacking certain um, uh, notions and certain images that we have around the Silk Road today, around globalization, pre-modern globalization. Um, and the other um, strain of my work sort of also departs from this Central Asia, Greater Central Asia past, uh, looking at the history of the nomad and following a bit of the philosophical discussion of the nomad um, as, a, as, a, as a figuration of, um, um, again, uh, decentering the, the, the concepts such as nation, national identity. Uh, national borders and all that. Now, the, the, the way I work is really um, working more as a, as, a, as a writer and as a curator these days than as an artist, I guess. 
um, and I work with artists who explore certain topics, similar topics that I'm interested in. I research together with them and I try to help them uh, with various capacities as curator, as producer, as commissioner um, of their, um, yeah, to, to basically think and work together. What I will introduce uh, um, in a bit is a very particular history that um, uh, around the time of 1930s and 40s in Northeast Asia, this, con this construction of Manchu Guo, um, that actually came out of uh, a collaboration with an artist uh, who I commissioned uh, a piece, this piece that um, premiered last year as a, as a lecture performance that deals with this history. Um, but we'll go back to the historical background of it. And uh, maybe a, a little bit of another footnote to this before we go into the concrete uh, presentation, is that when I deal with terms such as internationalism or emancipation movements, um, there's sort of a moral uh, necessity to them. There is a sort of moral weight to them that you almost cannot question them. And what I will do with this particular case of the Manchu Guo is to see how actually nationalism or, or emancipatory movements can be converted and can be turned into a fascist movement um, in itself. And, and that um, how actually the off, um, offsprings or the sort of um, legal heirs of these uh, historical predecessors, um, when you look at China today, for example, is actually doing the same things. So I think my way of working is very much beyond ideology or trying to go beyond these ideologically loaded terms where um, you sort of feel that you have to praise, I mean, Internationalism is already a term that is not in itself completely um, unloaded. Now, this history of uh, Manchu Guo or Manchu Guo um, that was um, constructed by the Japanese as a sort of puppet state, um, as you see on this map in the upper north, upper, what you see is basically East and Southeast Asia, and you see Manchuria area in Northeast Asia, bordering Russia and Mongolia, that area is, um, in the 30s and 40s, was the, the, the political puppet state of Manchu Guo. The area was more interesting as it was uh, served as a buffer zone before, uh, between uh, the last dynasty of China, the, the Manchu dynasty, hence the name, and the Manchu nomads that came from that re region originally conquered China, but later became basically a Chinese dynasty. Um, and it was kept uh, by the Manchu rulers uh, as a buffer zone between China and Russia, basically. And by the end of the 19th century, Russia had, um, through a series of wars, had Tsarist Russia, had, uh, had won a um, series of wars against China and had, uh, through the treaty, um, uh, the, uh, the possibility of building the Trans-Siberia Railway through this region, so connecting the rest of Trans-Siberia Railway to the port city of Darien, which is not really uh, reproduced here. Um, and uh, the, after the Russo-Japanese War, 1905, which uh, Japanese won, the Japanese considered this railway, or parts of the railway, and started the so-called South Manchurian Railway Company, which was effectively the, the sort of uh, uh, running on the same model as the British East India Company. And in that time, they had produced um, such um, grand plans for East Asia as this one. Not sure if you, your geography of uh, that part of the world is, <laughs> is really there. <laughs> okay, no, I going to do the basics. Um, so East Asia, uh, you see Mongolia and China today. Uh, going down south, you have the little island of Taiwan and then Southeast Asia with the Malaya Peninsula. 
India is here almost invisible, and then the vast sort of archipelago land of uh, Indonesia, just uh, Japanese also is sort of this archipelago land. Um, the Japanese um, had this plan of connecting all these regions, East Asia to Southeast Asia with railway and produced um, such a map actually. Um, and actually parts of the railway did exist, right? So it's part, parts of it was the tri siberia Railway, parts of it existed as Chinese railways and they just had this plan of connecting them. And we'll see why it's so um, uh, relevant to revisit this part of history. And what you see on the, on the upper um, side is actually a tilted map where uh, Japan is not visible, but the island in the middle is Taiwan, and the whole of East China is this, is this chunk of land, and Southeast Asia are represented here in, the, in this um, archipelago. They also had such plans, and this may be a little bit more familiar to you, uh, that uh, is a railway connection from East Asia, Japan, Southeast Asia, uh, all the way to Europe, with the ending point being Berlin, but certainly somewhere you have to change a train in Moscow. So, once again, that the, most of parts of the railway actually did exist in the early 20th century, and the Japanese had a plan of basically uh, integrating it into a greater uh, Eurasian network of connections. Um, the, the, what happened a bit later was that they, in the early 19th the 30s, they, um, they staged a uh, detonation and used that as an excuse to occupy the region, to, to send Japanese troops into this region of Manchuria. And they started in the next year, which is 1932, uh, to, um, to establish this Manchukuo, a so-called um, nation state, with the, uh, with the last Manchu Qing dynasty Emperor as the as the ruler, so you might know the Vatteluci film, The Last Emperor, talking exactly about this. The area of um, this is actually in the performance. Um, the artist uh, Royce Im uh, borrowed. We managed to borrow actually a real 1930s Japanese kimono a Japanese propaganda kimono that depicted either uh, aircrafts or war scenes, and in this case, uh, the map of uh, Manchuria and Korea, which were um, both under Japanese occupation at the time. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rather mu museological piece that um, we um, managed to borrow for the performance. And, um, the interesting character of this Manchu Guo uh, regime is that beyond any colonial um, state, it actually had a lot of cultural, philosophical underpinnings. So as you see on the steps, they propagate um, the peaceful and harmonious living together of five different peoples. Uh, the Manchus, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and Mongols, all various uh, people living in various um, uh, time periods already in that area of Manchukuo. And um, they also had, um, because it was, it was, it was a Manchu uh, regime, it wasn't officially a Japanese colony, and they never termed it as a Japanese colony, they actually uh, perform sort of the uh, um, how do you call it? relinquishing of the Japanese actual territorial rights, which is uh, commem commemorated on this uh, stamp in the upper left. It says relinquishing, um, yeah, commemoration of the relinquishing of uh, Japanese actual territorial rights. Um, now we get to the really exciting part of this history. Um, Japan, of course, later became part of the Axis power, and it was it went through industrialization in a matter of decades at a speed that was never seen before until China in the recent 30 years. 
Um, the way they did it was uh, first, of course, they borrowed European technology and everything. Um, there was one person who played a very crucial role, Nobusu Kokishi, uh, the guy who's um, in this uh, prisoner um, photography. He was, um, he was the finance minister, vice finance minister of Manchukuo. So he was sent by the Japanese government to be the vice uh, finance, uh, finance minister, whereas you always have to have a Chinese uh, finance minister on top of him, but in fact it was him who had to design and uh, execute everything. He had visited um, the West and he had assembled a very syncretic and very creative form of um, capitalism. So he borrowed from America Fordist assembly lines, he went to Germany and was very much in favor of German technocratic uh, engineer uh, uh, dominant uh, forms of industrialization. And he um, went to the Soviet Union and learned about the five-year plan and basically started his own five-year plan for Manchukuo, starting in 1936. Um, so he basically put all of this together and um, created what later became the most successful, the most efficient, state-guided uh, uh, capitalistic machine. Um, there are instances, for example, where uh, LG is a brand that everybody knows, right, from Korea. They still produce like air conditioners and phones. LG in the early 30s was like a was a textile factory. And the Japanese, of course, Korea was already under Japanese occupation. Um, the Japanese uh, rulers basically suggested that LG should start producing electronics, early forms of electronics. And that's how you have a state um, playing a very important role in, in guiding and in monitoring what uh, the big capitalists should be doing and then using cheap labor that was abundant in this occupied or colonized, semi-colonized zones uh, in Manchuria that um, effectively uh, um, helped them uh, going through this very rapid uh, period of industrialization. So yeah, Japan of course joined the World War II while the whole of um, uh, uh, the war machine was running from Manchuria, Manchukuo. Now, Kishi, after the war, was shortly convicted to be a Class A war criminal, but uh, was released by the U.S. because the U.S. needed a pro-American um, person to be in the government, and he was made prime minister in 1958. And he was also the grandfather of Shinzo Abe, the current Japanese prime minister, pictured down there, the men, they look quite alike. And uh, the, the, the lady is, of course, Park pa, uh, pa Kyung-hae, who was the recently impeached Korean president, whose father was the man here, uh, Park Chung-hae, who was the Korean dictator in the 50s and 60s, who was assassinated. Now, he was serving, he was standing in front of a Japanese flag, right, in the 30s. And he actually studied in Manchukuo in the uh, Japanese Imperial Army uh, Academy, and so there's a close sort of relation between uh, between Pachomi and Kishi as well as uh, in the post-war era when both men were in power, and under um, Pachomi, Korea turned Japanese war reparation money into Japanese foreign direct investment. So you get a lot of this sort of deals um, that go with personal connections. And you really sort of see the political DNA of East Asia. Um, and of course, as everybody knows, the tiger economy or the, the East Asian economic boom really happened with Japan and then with Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, all of them had borrowed uh, the experience of Japan and particularly the experience of Kishi in forming this sort of state-guided uh, state in a uh, uh, state led form of capitalism. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, and then we sort of skip a few decades um, to the present day uh, to refresh our mind a little bit because really the legal error of the, the country that had learned the most from this Manchu Guo past uh, is not Korea, it's not Singapore, but it's actually China itself. Right? If you think of this form of uh, state guide capitalism, which with these thousands of uh, state-run uh, enterprises controlling the key sectors, controlling energy, having cheap labor, deciding on the prices of things, uh, it was really the, the economic engine of China that made the country uh, sort of switch from one of the poorest countries of all the socialist bloc at the end of the 80s and early 90s, and after 30 years, one of the, one of the second or third biggest economy in the world, and China's um, current um, project takes a little bit of, um, it actually calls, it's called the New Silk Road, or it's the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the road referring to the Silk Road actually, and you see China building railways that connects East Asia to Southeast Asia to Central Asia and via Kazakhstan, Russia. Um, there are railways connecting to Europe, and China is building airports in Africa, uh, developing ports, uh, building this maritime uh, network of uh, trade and, uh, and uh, transfer of technology. And you sort of have a deja vu that this was what the Japanese had planned already back in the 30s or 2030s a vision they had had um, for uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. The Japanese back then called it the Great East Asian Co-Prosperity Circle, uh, with not just Manchu Guo, but also other occupied, Japanese-occupied uh, states, such as the Philippines, and, uh, the Malaysia, uh, Taiwan, and of course Korea. So there was a sort of you know, if Manchu Guo as a multi-linguistic, multi-ethnic construction of a state can be something like the Soviet Union, a smaller version of the um, Soviet Union, um, then the Japanese idea of the great East Asian co-prosperity circle could be something really like the European Union, a proto-European Union back in the days. Uh, but of course, if you look at what's actually going on. You see there's a strong state and there are those junior partner states and you see that these states are basically supplying cheap labor to the strong economies and you basically see the same sort of movement uh, of, um, uh, yeah, of, uh, of power that is, um, that is going on, I guess, in the European Union today. So that's the sort of um, like trans-historical lines of flight that I'm trying to draw, which kind of cuts across very vast geographical areas and cuts through also ideological camps because at the very beginning when the Japanese started Manchu Guo, they had designed it as an as a, as a emancipatory project, as, a, as, based on, as being based on the, the principle of national self-determination. Right? The idea that, that the Manchus, which were no longer ruling China today, deserve to have their own nation, and they deserve to go back to their ancient land, which is Manchuria, where supposedly this nomadic, semi-nomadic uh, people come from. So there, it was born uh, all of this, this, um, this um, moment of institutionalizing national identities, and it had this moment of emancipation, but at the same time it was also uh, 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 it was uh, 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 blatantly colonial and it was blatantly uh, violent. So I'm trying to give you a little bit, it's very complex I know, and it's also very complex even for East Asians to talk about this period of history, because none of the countries actually write this in the history book. China thinks it's too shameful, Japan never talks about its history anyhow, and Korea is, uh, is is, is um, they didn't play such a big role. They were really already oppressed for more than decades by the Japanese, so they didn't also um, work so much on this part of the history. But because of the complexity of history, we can see this, um, also the complexities actually of conceptual terms, such as nation, national 
uh, uh, national identity, uh, nation states, internationalism, you know, very kind of internationalism in a, in a, that had gone um, violent. And, uh, and then we can, with this in, in mind, we can sort of question what is behind China's BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, yeah, so I'm, I think I've done my job of bridging the past to the future, and hopefully it's not too much of a load um, to process. But I'm happy to, um, yeah, speak with you more in the dialogue. What, um, uh, yeah, what kind of discussion or questions or input we can get from, uh, from the room. So it will be, uh, I don't want to divide it so much. I think any time, please just uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, either come here or a microphone gets to you. Uh, we can um, yeah, get you into this conversation as well. Um, Maybe one question just to, to, to start off, uh, Oliver. When I, I, I remember um, hearing somebody that the state uh, never needs you, the state doesn't need you. And, and I had in mind uh, the Uncle Sam posters, you know, the war propaganda that says Uncle Sam needs you to join the US Army. So sometimes perhaps the, young, the, the state reminds you, reminds you, uh, remembers of you and uh, needs you. When, when it is your, your body that it needs for whatever uh, expansionist aspirations it may, it may have. Um, I want to try and bridge a little bit the two very different presentations by perhaps starting with the, uh, some of the local scales that we have seen in, uh, in, your, in your video, uh, Oliver. And I thought it was very interesting the Venezuelan example of dedicating 20 uh, days of work the year that you remarked upon you know, to social activism, uh, especially the way that it was phrased, because clearly that was not you know, a traditional professional activist audience. They were campesinos, farmers working the land with already an extraordinary difficult task of reaching the end of the month with enough uh, money to, to go forward. And so there was this appeal to self-interest, you know, uh, become an activist, become so mobilized socially, because that is ultimately also in, in your interest. It is through social mobilization that you're going to get electricity in your neighborhood, that you're going to get education or, or healthcare. Um, so that perhaps breaks apart a little bit the idea of small-scale community, such as that one was, it was a neighborhood community and then an assembly of, uh, of, the, of the city, um, and, and, and the rest of the space, with this idea that uh, from, from the local space, actually you can and must um, also work at, at different levels. In that case, it was the national level, they were referring to the minister, so on and so forth. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you your experience in, in, in that Venezuelan community, but also in the French case of the airport struggle, to what extent and how uh, a very localized struggle reaches out to, to broader struggles or to other parts of the country, or indeed even to struggles in countries beyond your own. So how much you experience that uh, contamination of spaces? Um, I think that many of these uh, local struggles wouldn't be possible without uh, certain networks that uh, usually go to the national and very often to an international level. Uh, and this is, for example, the case in this that uh, the film we saw at the very end. So, uh, when there was this reoccupation, so after this uh, first occupation, more or less, was tried to evict from uh, the police, uh, the police destroyed everything uh, the people set up there uh, over the years. And in this so called reoccupation, uh, um, Prefabricated uh, cabins and small houses uh, came from all over France, more or less, in order 
because it just takes too long to build new houses there and then it's much uh, a better portion order to fight the police to build something uh, pre-fabricated. Uh, so, yeah, th this is a very important aspect, of course, this, uh, these uh, connections and these networks. In the case of this Bolivarian uh, process in Venezuela, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a more complicated thing because also this relation between the state uh, and these grassroots initiatives uh, has been discussed uh, a lot, but I think that only very few analysts really uh, got the point, at least outside of Venezuela, I very often had the impression. The entire process was more or less just the fact that someone like Hugo Chavez became president that uh, has a history before uh, that means several years where grassroots initiatives uh, tried to push a progressive agenda and uh, overcome the current system and uh, bring someone in power who shares their ideas of, uh, of society and really wants some change and not only play with the myth of change in order to continue with the current state of uh, politics. Uh, and this uh, continued and also, so when Hugo Chavez was there, the media usually described him as a populist in a more positive manner, sometimes even as a dictator, even though he was democratically elected f five or six times, I think, and a proven in referendums. Uh, but uh, the, I think the central uh, uh, progress always happened from the grassroots. So there was a continuous push from the people from below uh, to, to show certain projects, to remind, and there was this continuous uh, demonstrating and marching to the government uh, with their demands. And the different thing was just that there was a president who did not wake and send the military or the police, but who tried to respond to it. And uh, in some cases that, that worked well, and in others it did not work so well. But it was a quite interesting uh, connection, I think, how this uh, uh, process emerged over, over the years and intensified. And what they uh, raise, and this was also the, the reason why I chose exactly this excerpt, it's a 94 minute film, so there would have been a couple of other possibilities as well, uh, that uh, those people uh, which are the most ambitious in these consecutive commonalities really had these consecutive commonalities as something in mind that starts from the grassroots and uh, that starts from below, but they had something in mind to dismantle the state and to establish something instead of the state. And I think they also did not want to stay and want to stop them when one state, Venezuela, is being dismantled. The interesting aspect, or one interesting aspect about this Bolivarian process is that there is a lot of international exchange with, at that time, the other leftist uh, governments. Bolivia, Cuba, Ecuador, and others. So uh, this would have been also, of course, a challenge to include those uh, who are in solidarity with the processes in Venezuela in this process of dismantling nation, uh, nation states and to come up with something that goes beyond. Always democratically defined. I need the microphone, but anyway, um, this connects to maybe something you may not even get to you for. Uh, there was the sentence of the guy at the Occupy protest who said, um, we need to, uh, you know, my idea is to network together different communities and localities. And this is something that one hears uh, often in the case of uh, communes, or in the case of the commons movement, but also as we were saying at the very beginning, in the case of, um, of municipalism, of municipalities, of linking together local administrations into 
national or global transnational networks. There are very concrete uh, proposals in this regard. The most famous one is probably Benjamin Barber uh, advocating for a global parliament of mayors, you know, bringing together city responsible to actually solve some of the global challenges that nation states are increasingly unable because of their national opposition to address, be it migration or climate change. Um, and that really leads to the, to the question of how do you govern phenomena, challenges, uh, policies that have a clear global dimension. Uh, th there is the risk uh, that in a moment when nation states, uh, for very many reasons, are increasingly unable to give themselves a transnational coordination to address uh, what really our collective future depends on, from questions of uh, nuclear escalation and peace to issues of uh, people flow movement is way beyond just the question of migration and clearly the climate question. The moment the nation states seem unable through their international, you know, interstate diplomatic framework to address those issues, um, the risk is that uh, those issues are not addressed. And when they're not addressed, normally the um, outcome is one of emergency. An emergency legitimates once again the state to come in with repression and power uh, and to discipline and punish uh, its people. So the question of how we uh, build power for changing globalization um, is, is an interesting one and it's important that this emerges through a, a kind of more horizontalist uh, approach of connecting communities. This is also my fascination for China because um, uh, oftentimes, you know, many of my comrades uh, in Europe, they say, yeah, it's impossible to change Europe, it's impossible to modify uh, the structures of the European Union, and it's true, it's very difficult to change them. Um, but then we are reminded that actually uh, there are still um, attempts to craft uh, a, a different world, which might not necessarily be one that I like very much in this uh, parallel, especially between Japanese imperialism and uh, Chinese commercial expansionism, but there is still a level of ambition, a level of aspiration that says, look, actually, what you have now, the kind of uh, neoliberal globalization framework, the framework that is increasingly in crisis, you know, with the G7 ending in crisis, the G20 not really solving anything, this framework is historically contingent and it will be replaced by something else. Uh, the Washington consensus uh, and so on and so forth is actually going to end. And so we need to prepare uh, for what will come after it. And um, China really comes in with this uh, gaze of constructing the world, the globalization of the next 50 years. Uh, it doesn't sound particularly pleasant uh, from the way that you describe it, so maybe you can expand a little bit on China's global vision in this sense, China's worldview, if you like. I just love those questions that puts you in a spotlight to speak for one, uh, a 1.5 billion strong country. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm also trying to draw certain lines from the, what was previously discussed and what we saw earlier from this communal movements and things. I, I think one crucial difference is, of course, how we approach this. We, I mean, I'll probably invariably speak of, yeah, I don't know, how China approaches uh, uh, decision making, right? Because the way I saw it from, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, there's a sort of a, a community where you have a clear sense of like what it is and you can discuss things and all of this to the scale of Occupy, say, Wall Street, where they were talking about that the state doesn't need us and who goes to war, da 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 da, and thinking at this level of uh, decision making and then coming to this, how China functions uh, in terms of decision making are actually clear, uh, very, uh, very diverse, uh, very different levels. Um, I guess China can feel kind of comfortable these days, like pointing at the finger at Europe and say, or America and say, haha, actually, um, this liberal democracy idea of everybody has a voice uh, is not valid because, and China can sort of say it from a, a, a very general, logically aware perspective, where it can say that it's actually it's not working, not because. Uh, uh, not because of the institutional uh, uh, setup, but it's because of the 
technology and it's because how um, how actually we're a Wednesday into an era that uh, basically world politics is not is not ready for. So speaking about affective uh, computation, for example, how you have this implanted or sort of almost pre-cognitive uh, um, ideas of certain things, how you get infiltrated by the advertisement that you have on social media and everything that influences unconsciously your decision-making process so that in the end you don't even know if, if, if you like something really because you like it or if you like it because actually all your peers like it. Right, so there's, I think there's a, I mean, we saw it with Trump, but with Brexit, with all of these technology guys behind, and we're clearly at a point actually where, where, where we're talking, when we're talking about my voice, or my world, or my vision, you are not so sure who that is anymore. So that's just a, a sort of, I think, a general, again, a self-critical moment of looking at where we are. And of course, what China deals with, with that is that there is a, there's a radical, non-existence of decision making for participation, right? So it's a, it's a wholly almost, um, not automated, but very sort of intricate, uh, self-maintained um, uh, decision, decision making system uh, with the different levels of uh, bureaucrats. Um, and I guess the, it organizes in a, in a much better way than back in the Soviet days. So that you actually have this, I'm speaking, for example, um, from the position of Daniel Bell, who speaks about the Chinese merit meritocracy, this idea that you promote um, um, uh, people with skills and ideas in a sort of fast track way, so that they can be in, they can be promoted in a very uh, yeah in a unusually fast fashion than you would take for them to advance to such a career elsewhere. Um, and that, um, yeah, these people, of course, have to have obey to certain ideological constraints of, of the Chinese Communist Party, but at the same time, they're also trained to solve problems. They're technocrats, and they do what they have to do to make the economy work, to give people jobs, to uplift the, yeah, the economy. So yeah, it, I mean, I'm very ambivalent about this, of course, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is a certain uh, there is a certain efficiency that you do not see elsewhere in this system of non-decision or non-participatory decision making. It doesn't. It doesn't go to <laughs> uh, uh, it, it does in a sense because uh, something exceptional that's. Uh, it happening is that since the implosion of the Soviet Union, and you know very much more than I do about it, um, it's the first time now historically when there is uh, an alternative model that is actually successful and somewhat attractive on a global scale. Um, and part of the uh, composition of that model is uh, the kind of decision making uh, and, and understanding of participation or, or lack of it that, that you were describing. It's no coincidence that uh, the success of the Chinese model is always referenced, for instance, by Viktor Orban, uh, by Erdogan to some extent. There is the reconfiguration of another pool of attraction that even uh, indirectly is actually transforming the functioning of, uh, of politics, even in the eastern part of the European Union itself, this legitimation that actually might work better to have a certain kind of authoritarian capitalism that is uh, not backwards at all. It's not the case of uh, you know Russia uh, exporting oil and, and, and little else. I mean, China is the only country beyond the United States that has a fully developed technological ecosystem that can compete with Amazon, with Google, with the big tech of, uh, of Silicon Valley. That's quite a powerful uh, business card for a political model that can shape uh, globalization indirectly in that sense beyond, obviously, what we've seen with the Silk Road and the, and the expansion. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions for Oliver and, and, and Yumi from, from here. I mean, it would be good to also see what, uh, what you want to say. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Thank you very much for, thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is uh, um, to somehow to connect the previous Biennale here, Biennale of 2015, uh, it was two, two years ago, and uh, 
Uh, it was a speaker from Canada, a researcher, Nick Dyer Lissaford, who wrote a book on cyber proletariat. Cyber proletariat, yes. Uh, and uh, he advocated the idea that actually, in, on the global scale, we now have um, have this uh, new form of proletarian uh, people, not not only proletarians involved in some information technologies, in some programming, in some IT, but all the um, all the actually workers, poor workers, proletarians involved in global supply chains, sometimes working in very poor conditions in, uh, with actually very poor technology, but uh, as, as some uh, original part of these global supply chains. And uh, so in some case, uh, he advocated the idea of, uh, to say, solidarity of all these proletarians all over the global supply chains from the every end of the world. And, mm, well, actually, uh, in Soviet times, yes, in, in times when this, uh, uh, this UFO object was built, um, uh, it was a tradition to somehow speak about the uh, proletarian internationalism as an uh, alternative to the bourgeois nationalism. Uh, uh, and uh, it is important that it should be alternative not to the nationalism generally, but to the bourgeois nationalism. And uh, that the proletarian internationalism should be a true alternative. And my question is uh, for you, what do you think about the, to say, modern world of globalization and to say cyber international, cyber proletarian? Uh, cyber proletariat, yes? Uh, do you think uh, is some cyber proletarian internationalism uh, possible now? Thank you. I'm sorry for my question. I meant to moderate, not answer questions. <laughs> Cyber proletariat internationalism. It's a difficult question that you asked, huh? so we take our time to reflect on that. Huh? I'll say a few words and I actually pass it on to you too, because you're more of a specialist on this. Um, I thank you for the question because it's very, it's very precise. It's, it, it, it brings us to the core of, of all the problematics being actually class and economic standings and global chains of, of capital flow that a lot of times, you know, when, you, as for example, when we started talking about China, we usually go a little bit into the more rhetorical sort of the timelessness and the anachronical politics of China, which we can use then to justify certain expansionist um, strategies, right? So I, I mean, I, I usually find myself sitting on panels or discussions where people sort of vary with all good intentions trying to understand this, this, um, from a culturalist perspective. And by that, I mean because uh, because they realize that Europe is not, or Eurocentrism is, is, is over and you have to understand other perspectives and other um, ways of doing things, Chinese globalization maybe, and, uh, but actually by trying to understand it through this culture and trying to connect it to a more ancient culture is already, is already, is already helping China in, 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 in um, building the real intentions. So, so I'm trying to, actually I'm leading this to a more real collection proletarian. <laughs> Uh, a, a discussion on the global, yeah, global capitalism today that I think you can uh, deconstruct better than I do. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, 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 it's very difficult also the terminology, no, and uh, the area and so on and so forth, but uh, to change a bit the terms of the debate, what I think is true is that um, 
when we speak about internationalism, um, we experience a kind of collective semi-colonial position or collective colonized, uh, or we're collectively in the position of the colonized. Uh, precisely because of the way we have understood internationalism until today and the way that it is understood today. Um, in, it's, a, it's a long discussion, but to, to, to make it a very short, um, to make it very short, there, there, there is, um, as you know, the international system, uh, the world gives it away. It's a system of relations between nations. Uh, internationalism as a world begins uh, towards the end of the 1700s. Jeremy Bentham uh, coins the term uh, international in order to signal uh, what until then was called uh, the law of the nations, the law that governs the relation between nations. And internationalism emerges not uh, by coincidence, roughly at the same historical time when nationalism emerges as the central historical vehicle. Uh, the word internationalism is coined just a few years before the French Revolution makes the nation the center, the central historical actor for the enfranchisement of citizens, you know, the rights of citizens, the rights of men and the rights of citizens. And, and since then, those two terms have often been, been, been in connection. Uh, you know, the figure of uh, an Italian revolutionary, Giuseppe Mazzini, who was at the same time a nationalist, he was fighting for the national independence of Italy, he was fighting even for the national independence of Poland. Uh, he set up uh, a bunch of nationalist groups across Europe, Young Italy, Young Poland, Young France, uh, in order to claim national self-determination. But he was also an internationalist. Uh, he founded uh, an international movement in Switzerland uh, called the Young Europe, which had the duty of grouping together all the different national struggles and envisioned a European Republic where different European nations would be in international cooperation one, one with the other. Um, then, at the same time, I mean, it's not a very well-known story, but while Mazzini was, uh, you know, fighting for his vision of internationalism through national republics, um, he was also fighting for hegemony over the International Working Men's Club in London. And another man who was fighting for hegemony over the International Working Men's Club in London was Karl Marx, who was living in London just when Mazzini was also living in London. And the two men hated each other because Marx used to say that uh, Mazzini was simply trading an old, um, uh, an, an old power, that of the Ancien Regime, of the aristocratic empires, for a new one, the power of the national bourgeoisie. So Mazzini was uh, wrong in claiming that national independence was the solution, because that would simply put people uh, uh, prey um, at the hands of capital, rather than at the, at the hands of foreign oppression. And instead, internationalism has, had to be understood through class, uh, cl class connections. It had to be an interclass. Uh, internationalism rather than an international internationalism. But then we know very well that that kind of interclass internationalism, and by the way, the Working Men's uh, Club in London was, of course, the first international, uh, where Mazzini, Bakunin, and Karl Marx fought for influence over, and then Marx won, and obviously the international became the socialist international. But that kind of interclass unity uh, very soon became an international. Uh, interclass unity. With the First World War, uh, the proletariat of Germany and of Italy and of France going to war one against the other, and then of course with the, uh, with the, with, with the Soviet Union and uh, what happens especially from the 1930s onwards uh, in terms of constructing a revolutionary system that really gravitates around an international interstate diplomacy with one strong hegemon at the center. Uh, that is that is Soviet Russia. So, a uh, long uh, story to say that I think we need to, in order to answer your question, we need to undo the word internationalism. Because the only way that we can recuperate control over it is if we transform it from a relation between states into a relation between people. Um, if, and, and this is why I say that in a certain sense we're all colonial subjects today. There is no way that we can collectively decide through any uh, democratic or participatory or even representative mechanism on challenges, on issues, problems 
They go beyond our national borders, our national level. Uh, there is no direct relation between citizenship uh, and international or global uh, political spaces. Even in the European Union, when you would expect in the European Parliament, you know that there is a transnational citizenship, actually the European Union really works like an international club of states with the strongest, most powerful state dominating that club most of the time. So, um, what I think we need to find a solution to is how we build uh, a transnational political force a transnational space where citizens can aggregate and exercise political agency directly beyond the level of, of the nation state. And in that sense, uh, and I finish here, it's, uh, it's really a very enlightening question. In that sense, I think the cyber part is important. Because if there is something that might, might enable us to construct a transnational political space, a kind of international, but that doesn't work through the national, you know, an inter. <laughs> Uh, an inter-citizen south, an inter-citizenship inter alliance, then obviously that will have to be done through a really innovative conceptualization of how we use new technologies. And new technologies is not Facebook, I mean that's old, it's already been there for quite a while. New technologies are also what's coming up next. And I mean this is not the time for us to be speaking about it, but we really should invest a lot in how we can utilize technological innovation to foster political construction at a directly international level without having the nation in that equation. So there was a complex answer, but the question was also complex. But now Oliver is going to solve, I think, this uh, conundrum. German and uh, Pivati Pattaya in 2012, around that time when they became quite big and oh, became all of a sudden like the uh, first biggest party or something. And they were talking about getting everybody internet and everybody should vote or something at their home, like a smartphone or a device and should vote every day um, or very often every week on certain things by sort of basically doing liking or not liking. Um, which um, back then had attracted a lot of people. I had the pleasure of talking to someone who was one of the, who was with Bitcoin since quite the beginning days and blockchain, and, and he was actually invited by the German Pirate Party, Beraten Partei, to help them develop the, the tools. And then he quit um, after having the first few meetings with them, realizing that actually what they propose with this liking and having this device at home, once again, is replicating the same structure where you have a front end and the back end. The front end is the sort of user end, and the back end is the, the administrative administrators of this uh, technology system, te technological system, as well as the sort of um, content providers, right, as to which questions you should actually ask people to vote on every day. So it's actually, it doesn't do anything. The, like the, the, the proposal of the German Pirate Party. And I, I see, um, yeah, I see it with a lot of new, supposedly new technological developments, we're replicating the old um, structures. Uh, hierarchies and yeah we need something radically different and I think where these guys and the blockchain people are heading into is somewhere that's completely apolitical but maybe they can be radicalized and start thinking about how can we again use that for not necessarily de decision making but for actually maybe distributing the information at all Right? As we were speaking earlier also, this, this, um, this uh, big, um, the Googles and Facebooks, they are not, um, if I could use a Marxistian term, I think we would look, we would have to look ways of uh, socializing or collectivizing means of production. And these days, if we don't look at you know the Filipinos and the poor Africans still working in the very very low class working class condition, these days production is information. Um, 
So the re-collectivization re or re-socializing of means of production will mean how do we gather and manage and distribute and, and use data these days. Nationalize Google, basically. That's a place to start. I have a Questions? quick comment. Yeah. yeah, because uh, we mentioned Google, and uh, I'm interested in the that we have a map here, uh, because uh, it's quite obvious that uh, power exists and it's imposing itself on two infrastructures, uh, through transportation ways, and the internet is like, it's not an abstraction. Flows are not an abstraction. Uh, data flows are not an abstraction. There are actual uh, cables, uh, uh, under underwater cables uh, across the globe that uh, internet is coming through. And uh, this is all managed uh, by a global, uh, a very global system of coordinates. And uh, speaking of Google, uh, they are also not only providing uh, the sort of uh, uh, search engines and mail and stuff like that, but they're also working on things like Hyperloop, uh, which is the very high-speed train that can cover like distances between, say, um, Denver and San Francisco in less than 20 minutes, which is uh, which China also is working on the same thing, but under a different uh, copyright name. So basically, the whole world is um, uh, is penetrated around by different kinds of uh, uh, not only train ways and uh, air airplane ways, but also cables and the actual uh, the the real of that infrastructure. And in fact, uh, uh, the example was blocking the airport the, uh, in order to uh, the, the airport construction in order to bring on the emancipatory project uh, is a very nice example because uh, this is how you like uh, it shows that uh, it's through blocking the infrastructure that something else might come in. But on the other hand, uh, it's in uh, the infrastructure itself that lots of emancipatory potential uh, lies within, like, uh, uh, because what is shown here, like the One Belt, One Road, of course, it's uh, like a capitalist initiative, but this is something that realistically uh, stands against uh, the far-right ideas, say, because here comes the, the reality of the um, uh, of the roots that uh, are there, uh, and uh, the movement of information, the movement of capital, and stuff like that. Um, also, if you go back to history, like uh, when um, this project has been was implemented, uh, lots of changes were uh, taking place within the countries that initiated it. And if you take uh, Japanese language, uh, it's uh, it has really transformed itself because it's like uh, things like table and pool are almost like English words. Most, many, many words uh, in Japanese are borrowed from English, and it's like it's uh, a lot. Of, uh, a lot of it is about the ability to uh, for, for the capability of for sort of resilience and the ability to, to transform ourselves instead of uh, like saying that let, let's block the infrastructure and like plant a garden or like sit in an unheated um, room and <laughs> discuss things instead of like there are like I'm saying that uh, there are probably uh, lots of uh, ways that we can be blind to sometimes that can be taken over yeah, I hope some of it makes sense. <laughs> Good, so do you have something that you want to add before we close it? Do I have a point? Look, I finish you with just, uh, I think, no, I finish you, it sounds, it sounds very bad. I, I finish you with a question. No. <laughs> I think we should, um, we should draw this to, to, to a close, but maybe to, to both of you, just, um, just one reflection on, uh, on where we are, actually. 
uh, today. I mean, you, you, know, you come from both sides <laughs> of Ukraine, you know, from one end and, and the other end of Eurasia, and somehow we are in between, in between the two sides. Um, and it's really striking, at least from my point of view, how um, um, we still fail when it comes to, to Europe to fully engage uh, Ukrainian society, Ukrainian civil society, activists, the art world in the kind of uh, you know ongoing conversations that take place within Europe. Uh, and perhaps something that uh, you know it's the first time I'm, I'm here actually. And, and something that, that uh, I would take it home is that we probably need to make an effort to, to, to broaden you know, the, the family of you know, uh, speaking about the international and the transnational, etc., etc., and to do what, what we can, I mean, in a small sphere, to, to really find a way of, um, of enlarging uh, our own you know, mental, professional conception of, of Europe. It's striking, you know, that you come here and suddenly roaming becomes a problem. You know, you pick up a call anywhere in Europe, it's the same money as your, as, as your country. You come here, and they charge you three, five euros per minute. You know, it's even a problem to, to get a phone call. So even beginning from very concrete, um, uh, uh, concrete changes that can bring people closer together. You know, making it easier to have university exchanges, not just obviously telephone calls. Making it easier to have cultural exchanges. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm really happy that uh, my organization is working now with, with Basel and the Visual Center to try and build. Um, cultural projects, pan-European cultural projects together. But this enlarging of our professional map, I think it's something quite quite important. It's also, I think, your first time here in Ukraine. So this is the moment when uh, three foreigners say stupid things about a country that they just, uh, they just got to, and I think it's a funny way of closing it. Yeah, but maybe it's a, it's a good country to, to raise such questions. I mean, I think in, in general, uh, yeah, I'm not speaking as an Austrian, I think she's, she doesn't want to speak as a Chinese. But we are speaking as people from the world, I think, and we are in a, in a political, social, ecological situation where we are completely fucked, so to say, right? I mean, uh, so there's, there's not just, it's not just, it, it's just a means, a, a mean of simply survival, I think, to, to achieve a change. Primarily, if we look at, for example, global warming or so, the effects of this will really mean catastrophe if there won't be action, not in decades, but in the coming years. And how to achieve this, uh, these activities is, and how to achieve these changes, of course, so clear uh, that it cannot happen like in this COP when the free negotiations between the heads of nation states because this completely failed already in the 23 previous years. So we, we need to find other uh, modes of, of coming to decisions and of getting also uh, the power that these decisions can really have effects in our political sphere. I mean, maybe it's interesting to raise such discussions also here because a couple of years there took a revolution place here, right? But that was kind of stolen from from the people who probably in the majority had uh, the right intentions and really wanted to, to get a change, but uh, it didn't uh, succeed in uh, order to be a transforming uh, revolutionary process. Uh, so, so that's also probably a central question of how to to get such such revolutionary process that uh, do not only exchange a couple of people uh, in, in governments and in, and in parliaments. And yeah, I, I focus a lot. You know what I focus a lot because I, I presented three examples. So I still have kind of the feeling or the hope that uh, the change will come from social movements. And uh, in, in, the, in 2008, internationally, banks got bailed out uh, with the argument that they are too big to fail. And I really think that yeah, our social movements must become so strong that they will finally become too big to fail so that it's impossible 
for any presidents or, or parliaments to uh, ignore uh, just the wishes uh, and expectations of, of, of people organized in, in, in social movements. I can't expect any will change solely uh, on a national level from parliaments anymore. very inspired by um, the past that had been here in the past, in the past century, um, also because I actually first went to Kharkiv before I properly got introduced to Kiev. Um, and, uh, and I share with the, 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 the sentiments and the passion and the personal and social investments into these revolutions recently. Um, however, I'm, uh, I'm not an activist, right? so I cannot uh, speak or act or uh, mobilize for the way that Lorenzo can do. Um, I'm more of a retreated person also because um, from witnessing the past of China in the last um, 30 years or so, you had this sort of moment, 89, of course, where basically revolution happened everywhere that ultimately dissolved the, 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 the socialist bloc. You had it in China, in Tiananmen Square, where many people died. And you sort of feel that after that, immediately it was the period of the 90s, where people just sort of pretended that it wasn't there and started working on the economic rebuild. And that was when China really um, opened door uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, open door, open, open its door to uh, market economy. So you sort of have this very, um, Mm, very irresponsible, maybe you could say, a, a sort of irresponsibility towards the past and towards what happened in that revolutionary moment, and then you just sort of carried on not thinking about it, which ultimately actually led, has led to uh, the success of the Chinese economy today. So, um, I was trying to get actually at the point that this was not exactly the, the case and that reform already had taken place in the 80s and uh, taking place at very local uh, levels that was of course, um, uh, that would have maybe, would have led to a certain uh, democratization of China at the point of 89, but it didn't because it disturbed deeply the very few people at power uh, in the top. So, in, yeah, in saying this, I'm, I'm trying to maybe um, uh, get at that there are they, there could be this sort of more local and uh, reformist uh, practices uh, that can go parallel to the state practice, which may or may not add up well, uh, maybe uh, absorbed in a good or bad way, but um, that they should be there. And I, I, I'm saying this because there's this profound sense of uh, uh, inability to do things um, in Ukraine, <coughs> among some of the friends and uh, colleagues I've met, um, which does not necessarily lead you to the, uh, the other side, or the exact uh, other side, which will be going on the street and going going protests and having unnecessary uh, martyrship, really. I'm trying to find a more um, a more uh, a more low profile and systematic uh, way of of initiating change that I hope we will see in the future in Ukraine.